Amen. Let's stand up and worship tonight. Praise God. Uh, I know this section looks a little empty. The Hope Center guys are at a men's conference, so that means you're just going to have to sing a little louder tonight, all right? And uh, if you want to sit over there, you can. I mean, it's, it's empty. It's kind of weird looking right now, but uh, maybe the crowd's going to show up, some other people. But glad you're here. Hope you've had a great day. Uh, but if you haven't, the day's not over. And to be honest with you, my greatest part of the day is when I get to just worship the Lord and forget about everything else. So here's your opportunity uh, just to dive in and enjoy God's presence uh, with each other. Father, thank you that this time right now is going to be filled with worship, God. It's going to be filled with prayer. It's going to be filled with your spirit, most of all. God, you are the God of uh, all of this. This is yours. We are your people. And we come here tonight to seek you, God. To, to see you, Father, high and lifted up, to, to be in your presence and to be with your people. God, bless this night as we seek your face, Lord, as we uh, show up, God. We know you're going to show up. You always have and you always will. And we thank you, God, for what you're going to do. We are here with anticipation. And, God, I'm thankful for every person in this room, God. There's so, um, so much they could have been doing tonight, Lord, but they choose uh, to do this, Father, to do something that benefits their soul. And benefits the others around them. God bless them for that. And let us in this moment get lost in you. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Let's worship together church.
are my joy, you are my song, you are the well, the one I'm drawing from, you are my refuge, my whole life long, where else would I go, surely my God is the strength of my soul. Defends me, your love defends me, and when I feel like I'm all alone, your love defends me, your love defends me. Yeah. Day after day, night after night. I will remember you're with me in this fight. Although the battle it rages on, the war is already won. I know the war is already won. Surely my God is the strength of my soul. Your love defends me your love defends me and when I feel like I'm all alone your love defends me your love defends me we sing Your love defends me, your love defends me, and when I feel like I'm all alone, your love defends me, your love defends me, surely my God is the strength of my soul, your love defends me, your love defends me. And when I feel like I'm all alone, your love defends me, your love defends me. We sing hallelujah, you're my portion, my salvation. God is the strength of my soul. Your love defends me. Your love defends me. And when I feel like I'm all alone, your love defends me. Your love defends me. We sing high. truck driver this week so I was uh, riding around and thanking God for XM all these podunk back towns it's nice to be able to tune into the satellite 
There's a sermon there, Brother Matt, if you need it. But listening to uh, one of the Christian music songs, and it kind of hit me. The phrase came up, broken and beloved. And how many times as Christians we get in a mess, you know, we get in trouble, we get in situations, people disappoint us, sickness in our families, that phone bill comes at the wrong time, and this problem and that problem, and we can let them stack up and we get ourselves in a mess. But at that moment, when we're as broken as we can be, when we're in the biggest mess we can be, when we're thinking about everything else in the world, Christ is still calling us as his beloved. You're my child. Let, let me help you. Let me fix that for you. Let, let, me, let me give you peace. Let me show you a path. Let me show you a way. And, and I just thought about how so many times when, when I'm at my most broken, when I'm at that moment, when I just don't, I'm a beloved child. Christ has died for me. He's given himself for me. And if I will, if I will just look to him as that beloved child, as that one that is there, Lord, how can you take me as this mess? That's what he'll take. He'll take those pieces. He'll put them back together. So praise God for those that are broken. You know, we want to fix it. We want to get out of this mess. But he wants those broken pieces. Bring those broken pieces to me. I'm your hope. I'm here for you. I'm here for you today, tomorrow, the next day. So praise God for the fact that he is our living hope. Let's all sing together. great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken I am forgiven, the King of Kings calls me his own. Thanks God, beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. in your name Jesus Christ my living hope praise God for that hope then came the morning 
that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe thank god out of the silence and the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me and then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me jesus yours is the victory Praise Him for that hope tonight. Amen, amen. Living hope, not dead, always alive, forevermore sitting at the right hand of the Father. Amen. Ever making intercession for you. When you don't think you got anybody, when you don't know how it's going to happen, when you don't know where it's going to come from, when you don't know the answer, you don't ever have to worry about anything because God's on His throne, Christ is at His right hand praying for you and the Holy Spirit in you listen to me when you don't even know what to do the Holy Spirit in you is speaking to the Son to the Father in order that these things that you need He's promised you will always have trust in the Lord do not lean on your understanding don't let your mind mess you up amen don't let your mind mess you up always trust in Him Father help us tonight to make sure we're leaning on that one who is our living hope. That our trust is fully in Him. Not in our abilities, God. Or our, or our inabilities, Father. That we completely trust in You for our salvation. For our sanctification. For everything that You're doing on this earth. We trust in You. We put our faith fully in You. By faith we will live. And in faith we will die and meet You one day. And we thank You, God, for all that You're going to do between here and there. Through a body of believers given to You and trusting in You. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give the Lord some praise. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. We'll go ahead and start dismissing some classes as you are sitting down as the team gets the stage ready for the Word of God tonight. All right. Let's start with 4th and 5th grade, Miss Sheila Allison. Right here, 4th and 5th grade, Miss Sheila Allison. Second and 3rd grade, Miss Olivia House. Back here at this store. Pre-K through 1st, Miss Stephanie Moore. Back here at this store, pre-K through 1st. Toddlers, Miss Cindy. Cindy's right here with the toddlers and the nursery Miss Alex Bailey junior high girls with Miss Maddie correct maybe are you the girl and then the rest of you with Mr. Derek
Ready? Hey, Kason, how are you, buddy? You want to preach for me tonight? Come on up here. You know whose kid this is, Eli? <laughs> Boy. Well, there's a story told about a young kid that many of you will know. Uh, that, uh, that. <laughs> Don't worry, you can't hurt him. Little kid that his dad was going to whip him as they was taking him out. Uh, he yelled at the congregation, y'all pray for me. <laughs> and uh, that's the toughest one of all them little boys. First Timothy chapter 3. And uh, man, I'm going to have to pace myself standing in the front row. If I do that for three services Sunday, I might not be able to preach. And then I've not done myself well. So I uh, might have to skip a couple of those worship services just so I just enjoy it so much um it's what a what a blessing it is our team's a great team they do a great job they're good at what they do and they're faithful um when we we had some people come in kind of looking at our worship team and and they were asking questions they said how long have y'all played together and we're like well eight some of us eight years ten years six years and they just couldn't believe that this team had stayed together that long and uh and uh i just say that is uh, indicative of them being given to God, understanding their calling, and being selfless. Um, they practice all the time. They're here at 5.15 on Wednesday nights, 5.30, till time to go to worship. And then Sunday morning, they'll be here. Some of them will be here at 7.15. That's when it starts. Some of them will roll in right a little bit after that. I won't tell you who those are. Uh, but uh, they'll be here earlier. <laughs> Uh, and then they'll they'll do three worship services. Some of them also. I don't know if I can handle this, guys. We got something else going. Um, some of them will uh, teach Sunday school. They'll lead classes. They'll do all that plus be on the worship team. And so uh, you gonna trade? Okay. Um, plus do all this other stuff. So encourage the worship team when you see them. Uh, thank the Lord for them and. And encourage them. Let me change this out. If I borrow it, I'm going to break it. Now I'll fix it, but I'm going to probably break it. That's why I try not to borrow anything, because it's going to get tore up. First Timothy chapter 3. Be thinking about what service you're going to come to uh, next Sunday. That sounds good already, doesn't it? And uh, this Sunday, uh, invite your friends. Remember, 8 o'clock, 9.30 or 11, and... Uh, you know, I've got some friends that are going to it because they have to go to multiple service, COVID scares and all that. Uh, we're doing it because of the demands of the people, uh, because there's too many people coming to the third service. We're going to try to split all that up. Just be asking somebody. If you ask somebody to go to church, the majority of the time they'll come with you. You listening to me? They say, how do we grow our church? How do we do this thing? We just ask people to be a part of what God's doing here. First Timothy chapter 3, I've been uh, studying on this all day and and soaking it in. And we're going to talk about two different offices in the church. This is our daily Bible reading for today. And we're going to talk about uh, what God requires in both of those offices. And then we're going to talk about the second office, the office of deacon. Uh, we're going to be electing or nominating them. We're going to get that started here in the next 30 days. So be listening to this. That way you know what that's going to look like as we go into these days uh, ahead. This is a trustworthy saying. If someone aspires to be a church leader, he desires an honorable position. So a church leader must be a man whose life is above reproach. He must be faithful to his wife. He must exercise self-control, 
live wisely, and have a good reputation. He must enjoy having guests in his home. He must be able to teach. He must not be a heavy drinker or be violent. He must be gentle, not quarrelsome, and not love money. He must manage his own family well, having children who respect and obey him. For if a man cannot manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? A church leader must not be a new believer because he might become proud and the devil would cause him to fall. Also, people outside of the church must speak well of him so that he will not be disgraced and fall into the devil's trap. Father, tonight, help us understand the difference between elders and deacons. And God, help us see the necessity of the role in the church. God, we thank you uh, that you have spelled out these roles, God, uh, that the people on the earth might get what they need spiritually and physically. And God, help us to tonight maybe even think about some people who would be able to be in these positions, God, and do them well in a way that would lift up the body of Christ here at Missionary Grove and in the county here and surrounding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The spiritual demands of a bishop or an elder, it says in verse number one, if someone aspires to be a church leader, the word church leader here in the Greek is the word episcope, where you get the word episcopal or episcopate, which means like a superintendent, someone who is overseeing, someone who is looking over, a pastor, a bishop, an elder. They are all the same word in the Greek. So when you read the first half of chapter number three, this is talking about your pastor. In some churches, it is a pastor and an elder board, a group of elders. In some churches, it's just a, a pastor board or, or however. It looks different in every church. Uh, but if you're going to be one of these leaders, there's things uh, that you have to be. There's things that you can't be. There's things that you must do. Now, the spiritual demands that we'll look at tonight on a, a, a leader, a bishop, an elder, and a deacon are the same spiritual demands. So the person who is an elder or the person who is a deacon has to live the same kind of life. But the function of an elder and the function of a deacon are completely opposite of each other. The function of an elder is a leader. The function of a deacon is just a servant. Anytime that a deacon tries to lead a church, that church is not led well because that is not the calling of a deacon. A, a, an elder in function leads, a deacon in function serves. See, the original elders in the book of Acts, chapter number 6, they said they needed to give themselves to prayer and the study of the word, and that's why there had to be deacons. Uh, elders lead the church, and then deacons are a function of pastoral care. They are not pastors, but they are the arm of the pastor going out to the people, loving the people, helping the people, feeding the people, being with the people as the leader of the people gets with God and gets the vision and prays, gets the sermon, leads in a way uh, that is pleasing to God as they serve in a way that is pleasing to God. We're going to run through both of these things and see how they work hand in hand and how they work together this is a trustworthy saying if someone wants to be a, a bishop or an elder or a leader he desires an honorable position so a church leader must be a man whose life is above reproach we will see that the uh, the opposite uh, of both are true we'll see that a church leader must be a man and if you look at the baptist faith and message you will see that a uh, pastor has to be a man but it leaves deacon open to a man or woman so the first part of this section is just going to a pastor bishop or an elder it must be a man now I know there's some people who differ with us on this interpretation of scripture but I believe it's pretty plain a pastor someone who has authority over others in the church has to be a man why he must be faithful to his wife a woman cannot be faithful to her wife or she's living in sin because she's not a heterosexual she would be a homosexual do you see what I'm saying 
So you have to understand a bishop, an elder, a leader has to be a man. These are not my words. These are Paul's words to Timothy. And you have to see that chapter 2, chapter 3, it's all instructions to Timothy about how to lead the church. A church leader must be a man whose life is above reproach. It has to be a man who's living a life that glorifies God in all aspects of his life. It can't just be in the church. There is no difference in the church life and outside the church life for the man of God. He must be the same at a football game as he is in the pulpit. He must be the same in a duck blind, and that would apply to me. I'm doing things that apply to me. He must be the same in a a duck blind as he is in the pulpit. He must be the same on Saturday night as on Sunday morning. And he's always got to live a life above reproach. God requires this of the man of God. I used to be very upset that church members required the man of God to live up here while they allowed themselves to live down here. Now, according to God's word, nobody's allowed to live down here. But according to God's word, I have to live up here. It wasn't the church people that held me up to that standard. It was God's word that held me up to that standard. I was mad at people for no reason. They were just wanting me to be what God said I should be. If you can't live holy, you can't be a man of God. Are we perfect? By no means. But are we striving for perfection? Absolutely. Are we striving for excellence? Absolutely. Are we running hard after God? Absolutely. Do we mess up? Absolutely. But do we stay in the mess? Absolutely not. We continue to improve ourselves and live in a way that nobody around us would say that let your your good be spoken evil of. We live in a way that is pleasing to God. He must be faithful to his wife. I have to be faithful to my wife. Amen. How can I tell you what has to happen. In the house of God. Or in your home. Or with your spouse. If I myself am not modeling that. In real life. And from the pulpit. I have to be faithful to my wife. I must have self control. I must live wisely. I must have a good reputation. You say, well, does it matter what people think about you? It matters that you're a representative of God. And yes, some people are always going to have something against you no matter what you do. But you live a life that way. You're not the one giving them that reason to have it against you. Amen? Some people will make stuff up. Some people just want to be mad. Some people just want to be upset. There's nothing you can do about those people. But you have to try to live in a way that they can't speak all of you and it be True, live wisely, control yourself, control your mouth, control your habits, control your body, control your mind. Self-control is not in just some areas. As a minister, as an elder, as a bishop, as an overseer, I have no right to ever make the statement, I just can't help it. I can never make excuses for my sin Because Christ is telling me in this word here, I have to have self-control and I have no excuses. He must enjoy being in the company of people. I think some people miss that part. To be a minister, an elder, to be a bishop, an overseer, you must be willing to have guests in your home, to be hospitable. You got to be a people person. Like I've heard pastors say before, I just don't like people. Well, you don't need to be a pastor. You got to love people. You got to like people. You got to invite them over for dinner. I thank God for my wife who, when I say, hey, can we have so-and-so over for supper? I want to get to know them. I want to meet them. Or she's always saying, hey, we need to have so-and-so or this person or that person. You know, and if you haven't been invited, don't get upset and offended right now that I'm talking about this, okay? We have very few. We have one night a quarter that we can do this. So if you'll stay here for 21 more years, we'll get most of you in, okay? (laughs) You know, we try to be hospitable. We try, but you have to be as a minister. My position requires you to be able to have guests in your home. Must be able to teach. 
I, I have the gift of preaching. I have to work on the gift of teaching. But it is no excuse. I can't just say, well, I'm just a preacher. I'm not really a teacher. No, I have to be able, I have to make myself to this. When I first started preaching, I was very uncomfortable with giving altar calls. Uh, I was more of an ev- uh, uh, a revivalist, not an evangelist. I was more of a, I give the gospel, but it's hard for me to harvest. And, and I know some men of God that are great harvesters. Uh, but when I was reading the scripture one day, it said that a pastor must do the work of an evangelist. I didn't have a choice. I couldn't say, well, I'm just not a real good evangelist. I'm just not a real good harvester. I'm just not a real good teacher. I just really don't like it. Once God calls you into these positions, then you have to take on the form of what that looks like. In fact, if God calls you into a position that is plainly laid out in Scripture, you might not be comfortable with what it looks like, but you have the ability through God to do what He's called you to do. He wouldn't call you to do it if you didn't have the ability. Some of you say, I just don't know. Well, uh, Moses didn't know either. He was a stutterer, right? Let, 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 let my people go. That would have been real convincing, wouldn't it? But God said, I've got a plan. You don't have to say a word. Your brother can speak for you. You do what I tell you to do, Moses. Don't you let what you think you are keep you from doing what God's told you to do and being what God says you are. What God says you are, what you think of yourself matters less than what God has already said about you. Do you believe that? Sometimes our self-esteem and our lack of self-confidence gets in the way of our callings when God has already given us the ability to do so if we just trust in Him more than we trust in ourselves. Listen to what God's telling us tonight. We have to be able to teach He must not be a heavy drinker. He must not be given to wine. He must not be thinking about that all the time. Uh, He must be Ephesians chapter 5 where Peter, I mean where Paul says to not be drunk with wine as where is an excess but be filled with the Spirit. A man of God can't be looking for a drink uh, from a bottle. He needs to be looking from a drink from the fountain that never runs. Ah, the Holy Spirit, okay? So if somebody has a problem with alcohol, if somebody has a problem with getting drunk, if someone has a problem always thinking about that substance, then they can't be a pastor, an elder, a bishop, an overseer. God says they can't. They, they, they have to understand this is what they cannot do. They must not be heavy drinkers. You say, well, I don't think they should drink at all. Well, I'm not disagreeing with you. But I can't tell you from scriptures you shouldn't drink at all. What I can tell you though is it will ruin your witness. It can ruin your family. It can ruin your life. It can cause you trouble that you never had to be caused because you didn't need it in the first place. I can give you a whole lot more reasons why you shouldn't do it or shouldn't touch it than why you should. So don't put the vice on because it's easier to keep the vice off than to put it on and try to take it off. Amen. Don't be given to wine. Don't be given to drinking or even dishonest with money. What's a pastor do? What does an overseer do with his job? Sometimes he oversees finances. I don't. Just so you know, I can't write a check from this church. I, my, I turned my debit card into the office. Like I, can't, I have no ability to get a bunch of money and do a bunch of stuff. We are congregationally led. Your church council makes those decisions. In business meeting, we set a budget. That's the money we spend. But a man of God can't be drawn to money in such a way that when he gets in situations where that is even an option, that he would even think about doing something wrong with what people have brought to God's storehouse. He's got to be satisfied. Now listen to me. A man of God has to be satisfied with what God has given him, whether it be a little or a lot. That way he never touches what the ministry is using for the glory of God. Being content in what you have. I don't need, listen to me, I don't need that money. 
God provides mine. I make a salary from this place. You set that salary. I have never even been in the meeting where they said it. I don't have no input in it at all. I don't tell them anything. Whatever God gives me, praise God. I give back to him generously. He gives back to me. I don't need to steal everything, anything, because God gives me everything. I don't need it. And if a minister's not satisfied with God, satisfied with what he's got he'll get his hands in something he ain't supposed to have them in which will cause the church great issues they must be committed to the mystery of the faith now revealed and must live with a clear conscience what does that mean the mystery of the faith when Paul wrote the mystery of the faith he meant the gospel must be committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, that is what has now been revealed. And they must live with a clear conscience. I am doing everything in my ability to be everything that God has called me to be. Preaching the gospel, giving the gospel, doing what God has called us to do, being what God has called us to be. Also, listen, a church leader must not be a new believer. He can't love money. He must manage his own family well. His children must respect and obey him. If he can't manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? I don't want to go to that other part. I want to talk to this for a minute. If I cannot raise my own children correctly, I can't lead this church. You listening to me? Did you know that sometimes a minister's children disqualify them from the ministry while they're in his house? Now, while they're out of his house, there ain't nothing he can do. They grow up. They leave. They don't live for God. He raised them right. There's nothing he can do. But if I can't control John, Derek, and Maddie, and Sophie, and Kingston, if I can't do that, then I have no right to stand up here and try to do anything else. I have to rule my own family well. Because if I can't lead those four kids and my wife, how am I going to lead a congregation of 500 people? Now, here's what I've never seen. I've seen a lot of ministers' kids out of hand, including mine. I'm, I'm being honest with you. But I've never seen a minister step down because his kids were out of line. And I've never seen a church say, you've got to step down because your kids are out of line. I don't really know what that looks like. I pray I never do. Amen? I pray, as my two oldest have been saved already and baptized, that my two youngest get saved and baptized. I pray Tiffany keeps acting like she is. Amen? She's the best thing I got going for me right now, to be honest with you. So I pray she just keeps towing that line, and we don't ever have to deal with it. But if there ever becomes a point where my kids are raising hell in this community instead of me raising heaven on earth, it'll be time for me to sit there and let somebody else stand here. I have to realize that in my own life. I have to be willing to accept the fact that if I can't raise my kids, I can't lead a church. A church leader must not be a new believer because he might become proud and the devil would cause him to fall. Why? Why can't they be young? Well, wasn't Timothy young? It didn't say young. It said a new believer. That's two different things. You can be young. When Paul wrote to Timothy in this book here, Timothy was in his early 20s. You listening to me? But he wasn't young in the faith. Remember what Paul said to him? Remember your mother and your grandmother who raised you right, who brought you to Jesus, who taught you the faith, who brought you along? It, it wasn't that Timothy was a novice. He was a young man, but Paul also wrote to Timothy, and he said, let no man despise your youth, but be an example to them in your faithfulness, in your purity, in your speech, all of those things. Be an example to everyone that's older. Don't let them look down on your youth. Just because you're young in age doesn't mean you're young in the faith. You listening to me? We don't need a pastor that's just been saved. We don't need leaders in the church that have just been saved. I get it. Everybody is jumping, ready, rip-roaring. I got it now. Let me do something. But we will see here that pastors, bishops, elders, and even deacons must be proven before they're put into a position. They, it, the eight, there's no age qualification but they must be proven to be spiritually mature and full of faith 
before they are put into these positions. The church leader must not be a new believer. Let me see what time it is. Amen. The church leader must be a new believer. Uh, can't be a new believer because he might become proud, lifted up, and the devil would cause him to fall. Also, people outside the church must speak well of him so that he will not be disgraced and fall into the devil's trap. I was sitting with a bunch of preachers uh, Monday. Some of y'all might know Malcolm Norton. Malcolm Norton was a faithful Baptist preacher at Trezevant Baptist Church for many years. Um, he was known as the community's pastor. Even though he pastored that one church, he did more funerals and weddings of people outside the church than he did inside the church. Everybody knew him. Everybody loved him. And he was well respected in his community. How are we going to do anything great in this community if the one standing behind this pulpit is not respected in it? It's just the truth. You, Brother uh, Dennis Truel, McKenzie First Baptist, he preached for us and then he got COVID. We didn't give it to him, I hope. I would like to have him back sometime. He's that community's pastor. He goes to the restaurant every morning, sits at the old man's table, talks to everybody. Everybody knows him, well respected. In fact, they gave him a, one of the waitresses the other day, gave him one of the best compliments I've ever heard a preacher get in my life. She said that, Brother Truel, you are the most well-rounded preacher that I've ever met. Well-rounded. He could talk to people, walk with people, love with people, cry with people, rebuke people, help people. Just talk about basketball at the table if that was what they're talking about. But he was well respected. He is well respected. I know they're not going to agree with everything I say from this pulpit. I know they're not going to agree with everything that we preach and that we talk about. Amen? The world doesn't agree with that. But I have to believe that God wants me to be well respected whether they believe what we are saying or not. They must be spoke well of so they will not be disgraced. God will not be disgraced. The minister won't be disgraced and fall into the devil's trap. In the same way, deacons. So what we said at the beginning was the spiritual demands of an elder bishop, that, that leadership role, the spiritual demands are the same for a deacon, but the function is different. In the same way, deacons must be well respected and have integrity. The word here for the deacon being well respected is the word where we get gravity, grave, weight. The weight of the seriousness of what they're doing. To be a deacon is a serious position in the church of God. It's not a leadership position. It's a servant position. But it is a servant position that must be taken seriously. It's not a joking matter. What, it, what he's saying here is the reason he uses this word. He's saying, what is gravity? Gravity holds you down, right? It's the weight the weight of being a deacon is the seriousness, the, the gravity of it. They must be. So listen, when we start talking about we're going to have deacon nominations or we're going to have a, a, a deacon election, we're going to submit names for deacons. However that system is going to look like, you need to be thinking right now, who in our church is well respected and has integrity? If they're not serious people, serious about the work of God, serious in the community, that have their, their word is their bond, their handshake is true, they're, they're, it's yes and no, that's exa they make promises, they keep them, they, they, they go where they say they'll go, they do what they say, they, the integrity of that position is a must. You have to have integrity and be respected to be a deacon. They also... They also must not be heavy drinkers, given to wine, dishonest with money. I heard a preacher say one time, you know, deacons, they go visit old ladies a lot of times. Widow women. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Nobody knows what I'm talking about. Anybody ever been in church here before? Anybody know what a deacon is? Deacons are here for widows and orphans and hurt people and sick people and 
hospital visits and nursing homes and sister old granny so and so that her husband's passed away and her gutters are falling off her house and or the door won't shut or or, or somebody dies or something the pastor the elder the bishop is getting ready for Sunday and Wednesday and spiritual counseling and all this stuff and the pastor calls this group of people and says hey I gotta have some help and that deacon is ready to go serve that person but they can't be drunk how you gonna call a drunk person to go help somebody pretty practical wouldn't you say they can't be drunk and they can't love money well you go to sister so I heard this preacher tell this story about this he said you go over to sister so and so's house and she's got a a real nice uh, uh, you know a gun on the gun rack from her late husband and it's real nice or something like that and that deacon's looking at that going Oh, sister, I sure am glad I'm here to help you. Man, that sure is a nice gun up there. Boy, I sure wish I had one of those. Man, I'm so glad I'm here to help you. I, it's always been my dream to have a gun like that. Man, I, I just thought all my life, I've been praying about a gun just like that one. Now think about what I'm saying. If a person is going to be a person that helps somebody who's in a hurting position, who's got stuff of value, they can't be a dishonest person. Like, oh, I, I'm going to use this p p integrity, honesty, honest with money, not a drunk. They've got to be a person when they go in there, they're in there to do the Lord's work, not to scavenge off somebody that doesn't need them to do that to them. No, it doesn't matter what they got at home. You're not there to gain anything but from the Lord a well done, my good and faithful servant then, because you just went and loved them through their mess. If God wants you to have something, he'll give it to you, but don't ever do anything in a dishonest way and for filthy gain. If you're going to be a deacon, you better be satisfied just like the preacher is with what he has, what God has given you. And don't be doing hinting around to the old lady that has something you want, hoping she will give it to you. I thought that was a pretty good story that preacher told. I didn't do it. Somebody else did. They must be this person that's honest, committed to the mystery of faith. All of these things, before they are appointed as deacons, let them live closely examined. Think about this. Sometimes we have, uh, I've seen it in churches before, have deacon nominations. And everybody just throws them up there. And then a week later, they come back, they get these names, they, they vote them in, and, and they're the deacon. Well, that's not how the Bible says do it. The Bible says, look, before they are appointed. So deacons are appointed by the church. The ministers can't do the work that they need to do because they're doing all this other stuff. The deacons will be an extension of the minister's arms and pastoral care. And they are appointed by the church. Now think about this. Before, let them be closely examined. So if we have a deacon nomination, you turn people's names in. All those names have to be closely scrutinized to see if they live up to these qualifications. And before we as elders of the church lay our hands on anybody as a deacon they must go through some type of proving time to see if they are worthy to do the job that you've appointed them to do you listening that 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 you need to help us figure that out some of that not all of it listen to me prior before who who is a man of integrity who is a woman of integrity? Who is a, a man of the word? Who is faithful to the church? Who is that woman that has compassion? And when I say a man or a woman, we're not going to get dogmatic on this. Some people say when it says uh, in the same way their wives must be respected. Okay, I agree. If you're going to be a deacon, your wife has to have the same character you have. But other translations say the women deacons. We're not going to get dogmatic. Either way, it's using women in a deacon work in this passage. Whether they're the wives of a deacon or they are a deaconess, they have to be women of integrity too. 
So, if you nominate a man, you better make sure that his wife is well respected, not a slanderer, has self-control, and is faithful in everything they do. If you nominate a deaconess, then she must be well respected, not a slanderer, have self-control, and be faithful in everything she does. You listening to me? Male deacon, woman deacon, the historical stance of the Baptist church is that women are allowed to be deacons. Historical stance. Every church is autonomous. They can choose whether they want to do it or not. It's my belief as your pastor that we have the opportunity to let women operate in their callings in these positions in order to go visit the widow to help the woman be able to be what she needs to be. There's a deaconess that can go with there or to that place or to that woman. That way there's not a male having to go be with a woman by himself. A woman can go be with a woman. Or a male can go be with the male. You see what I'm saying? It helps you not have to cross lines that don't need to be crossed between male and female if you have men deacons and women deacons. They must be respected. They must not run their mouth. They must have self-control. And they must be faithful in everything they do. A deacon must be faithful to his wife. He must manage his children and household well. Sometimes children disqualify deacons from... Deaconing, is that a word? It is tonight. And those who do well as deacons will be rewarded with respect from others. Why? Because they have integrity. Because they do what they say they're going to do. Because they help people. Because they love people. Because they always live right. Because they are the hands and feet of Christ. They are a representation of the pastor. They are all these things. And people look upon them with respect. And they reward them. Listen. They're rewarded with respect from others. And will have increased confidence in the faith. In their faith in Christ Jesus. I'm writing you these things now. Even though I hope to be with you soon. So that if I am delayed. Timothy, you will know how the people must conduct themselves in the household of God. This is the church of the living God, which is the pillar and foundation of the truth. Without question, great is the mystery of our faith. There's that word again. Christ, this is the mystery. It's not a mystery to us whom it's been revealed. Amen. I'm not wondering, this is the truth. Christ was revealed in the human body, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, announced to the nations, believed in throughout the world, and was taken to heaven in glory. If you desire to be a bishop, an elder, an overseer, or any of that, and you are a man, you desire a good thing. If God is calling you to that, you need to come to some of your pastors and let us know. If you desire... To be a deacon in this church. And you believe God is calling you to serve in that capacity also. You need to come to some of your pastors and let us know. As we fulfill these callings as in the future. These people in our local congregation are brought to the front. Then this church is going to thrive and flourish. Because all of us are going to be acting in a way that promotes Christ. That pushes us in our calling. And that way, listen, I minister here. And then the deacons minister everywhere else That I can't be or that Pastor Blake can't be. Amen. So it covers it. There's no one that ever feels alone. That's why they did deacons. It was because the Grecian widows and the Jewish widows in Acts chapter number 6. They didn't call them deacons there. But they said, hey, uh, the food rations aren't being handed out like it should. Us preachers, uh, overseers, bishops, we need to get in here and pray and study. And we need somebody to go take these meals to these ladies, these widows. I'm just being honest with you. I think if. We can get a deacon body here. We've got to act. We have a deacon. Uh, Brother Eddie is our lone deacon. He's been suffering me for the last 10 years. And he's a good one. He does it all the time. He does it behind the scenes. You never know it. He's visiting. He's going. He's doing. He's never quit deaconing. Uh, But along with him and the size of our church and the necessity of needing it for pastors, we're going to have to elect some more. That way he can have some help. And that we can have some of y'all fulfill your calling. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name uh, that you're going to do this in our church. You're going to raise up bishops. You're going to raise up elders. You're going to raise up overseers. 
You're going to raise up teachers. You're going to raise up deacons, servants of the Most High. We thank you for that. And we thank you, God, that in the days ahead, Father, that we're going to be able to have a much greater reach across this congregation, fulfilling and able to bear others' burdens, Lord. We thank you uh, for everyone that's already serving in these capacities, and we praise you for the ones that are going to. God, we praise you for this Sunday going to three services. God, we just ask you to bless our church. Uh, bless us with the Spirit of God. May your Spirit reign supreme. May you be poured out on all flesh. May the lost be saved. And may you fill this building for your glory and yours alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. See you Sunday. If you come into the 830, don't, I mean the 8 o'clock, don't be late and show up at 830, all right? Spirit sound.